Hello and welcome to another episode of Mean Brews. Today we're covering Saison, Belgian and French Saison. I've really dreaded uh, covering this recipe or this style. Um, I think you'll see in the data that this is really an artistic style and doesn't really fit in the mold of what I'm trying to do. However, um, I think there are some good nuggets from this um, investigation to kind of show you know, how the style is evolving, what people are using. Um, but there is a, a very wide variation, um, and a lot of people do not conform to the norms for what this style, I don't know if there even is a norm for Saison. Um, so let's just get right into the data and I'll show you what I found. Um, I found 61 Saison, winning Saison recipes. By far the most winning recipes people have shared. Um, and four of them were best of show. We had 36 gold, 10 silver, 5 bronze, and 6 award winning recipes. Um, this is BJCP style 25C. Most commonly a pale, refreshing, highly attenuated, moderately bitter, moderate strength Belgian ale with a very dry finish, typically highly carbonated, and using non-barley cereal grains and optional spices for complexity. Um, again, when I look at this, uh, evolution's off the charts and the variability is off the charts. You know, this can be served in three different strengths, um, session, pale, and strong, and also in any color under the, the rainbow. Um, it's really a, a you know, a, a style that, that could be, that has really no limits. So, um, it's very difficult to, within this program to kind of characterize what this style should be. Um, for the original gravity, you can see the BJCP range between 1.048 and 1.065. However, we had recipes ranging from 1.035 to 1.079. The mean was right at the average of 1.058. Um, right off the bat, we're getting some evolution. Um, this is the original gravity um, with, with time. We're seeing that come down to around the 1.050, 1.055 range from somewhere in the 60s and 70s. Um, so we're already right off the bat some evolution. IBUs again are big swing outside of the of the BJCP range with an average of 29.1. SRM, this is where the range is pretty big to accommodate the lighter versus the darker um, brown and, and black Saisons. However, most of the winning recipes, all but I think one, were a light colored, and they averaged at around 5.9 um, SRM. So keep that in mind, the darker Saisons are not doing, at least in my data set, not doing as well in competition as the more traditional uh, light colored Saisons. Uh, for the malt types, 90%, uh, 91.1% base malt was the average, 2.3% crystal, 1% toast, 0.1% roast, it was that one dark recipe, and then 6.5% adjunct. Uh, for the distribution, so if they use those malts, here's the percentages they use. So base malts, anywhere between about 72 and 100%. Um, and then zooming in on the others, um, adjuncts, we had somewhere between 3 and 25% um, of the grist. With an average of whoops, with an average of right around 10% of the grist. Uh, crystal, we had about 50% of the recipes used crystal malts, at an average of 0.5 to about 11% of the grist. Um, sorry, an average of about 4.5% of the grist, but that that was the range. And then toasted malts, um, we had somewhere between 2 and 22% of the grist. Only about 17% of the recipes used them, and about 5% of the grist was the average. Um, the one roasted malt I didn't show on here. Um, we are seeing an increase in the percentage of crystal used over time, um, somewhere from, from 1 or 2% to almost double that. And it's typically in the form of uh, care pills or a light crystal uh, type malt. Base malts. Um, most prominent base malt is a Pilsner malt. I didn't differentiate between Belgian, American, British, or German Pilsner malts. It would just make it, make it too complex. Um, the average for the uh, Pilsner malt was 76% of the grist. 100% of the recipes used some sort of Pilsner malt. 
Um, the next most prominent is wheat malt. 66% of the recipes used a wheat malt at an average of 11% of the grist. And then we have, I'm not sure if I showed Munich down here, Vienna and rye. I'm not sure if I gave that. Yeah, Munich, 30% of the recipes used a Munich malt at an average of about 11% of the grist. We have Vienna, rye, and then some others, some chip malt, uh, Maris Otter, Golden Promise, Spelt, or Oat malts. One or two recipes each used uh, these last four. All right, busy graph here, but let's walk through it. So we have two different y-axes. These are the percentage of the grist, and this is the um, this is also percent of the grist. However, I'm showing Pilsner and Munich on this chart because they're a, a larger percentage of the grist, and I'm showing wheat and rye on this y-chart. So what we're seeing is a decrease in time of Pilsner. Uh, the percentage of Pilsner and a dec decrease in time of Munich over time of Munich malts in the grist, average grist that people are using. While conversely, we're seeing an increase in time to somewhere around 15% each of both wheat and rye malt. Rye just kind of popped up on the scene here in the early 2010s and more and more people are using it. Um, conversely, Munich and Munich is going away and I think I present that later on, but Munich is is popping off of the uh, off of the radar for the style, um, so I think people are uh, in the early two thousands, late nineteen nineties, were using Munich to kind of give it some complexity, um, and now they're kind of switching to either more wheat and more rye, or just more rye and spelt or some of their specialty grains. Um, crystal malts, the most common crystal malt was uh, Carapils, twenty one percent of the recipes, not a lot used Carapils at an average of 4.7% of the grist. Um, and then light crystal, 18% of the recipes used a light crystal at an average of 4.1. I'm not sure if I shared, no. Medium crystal and special B rounded those out, but very small proportions of the recipes used um, these two malts. Um, there is enough to warrant putting some crystal in your recipe. Um, I think more than a third, which is usually my criteria for including it. Um, we're, we're used a crystal malt, so I will have some uh, care pills in my recipe at the end. Toasted malts, um, again, not a lot. The most prominent was aromatic. 8% of the recipes used aromatic at about 4% of the grist. Um, and then biscuit and honey malts, melanoidin and special roast were in individual recipes each. Wouldn't recommend using a toasted malt here, just not a lot of prominence here for inclusion in, your, in a recipe. And the one recipe that used carafa as the roast malt at around 4% of the grist. Adjuncts, this is where people like to play. I mean, look at all these adjuncts here. So the most prominent is candy sugar. Um, let's see, 16% uh, of the recipes used the candy sugar at an average of 7.8% of the grist. 15% um, used sucrose, which is table sugar, uh, cane sugar, at an average of 6.4% of the grist. And then flaked wheat, first flaked malt, 11% of the recipes used flaked wheat at an average of 10.3% of the grist. Dextrose, which is corn sugar, 11% used dextrose at an average of 8.2% of the grist. And I think that's all that I covered with my text here. There's also some others. Uh, fl the orange curve here is flaked oats, and the yellow curve is turbinado sugar, and then some other flaked or honey or Piloncillo um, sugars. This you can just tell the sweet spot here is between five and ten percent of the grist. So whatever you choose, and this is where you kind of get special with what you want to do with your saison. Whatever you choose, I think the sweet spot is definitely within this five to ten percent of the grist. So um, however you want to take your saison, keep in mind that ratio. Bittering hops all over the place. Um, most common were steering Golding. Sorry, this was 20%. The same with uh, Haller Middlefru and, and Sots and Magnum. German or continental European uh, hops ticked up, took up more than 50% of the bittering hops used, uh, followed by a whole bunch of others, just random other ones. However, we are seeing in t with time, the three most prominent hops, Sots, Steering Goldings and Holler Tower Minifru, people are just not using them nowadays. You know, the classic Saison of the 
1990s and 2000s that was winning competitions is not winning with these classical hops. And you'll see that in the flavor and aroma hops later on. The the evolution down of the uh, noble varieties um, just just going away from prominence. Flavor hops, sots, 16% of the recipes use sots. sots. Styrian Golings, 11%, EKG, that is 50% of the flavor hops used, and then a bunch of other little ones. Um, you'll see New World varieties, real fruity varieties, um, Citra, Rakao, Lemon Drop, Haller Blanc, Laurel. These New World varieties are really popping into favor here um, in the late editions and dry hop editions for Saisons. Uh, Roma hops, hops, sots, most prominent, 33%. Steering Golings, 15 That encompasses about 50% of the recipes. And then the rest, again, you're seeing these Calypso, Laurel, Opal, Nelson Savon, Amarillo, Lemon Drop, or Cow Mandarin. A lot of these fruity, flavorful hops, Hard Galaxy, are starting to pop up in these recent recipes. Um, this is showing... The prominence of Sots, which was the most prominent late edition hop, over time for both flavor and, and aroma hop editions, and they're they're going down to nothing. So even though if you go back, Sots is the most prominent for flavor and aroma, they are they are not being they're not winning as much, I would say, in competition as some of the other hops that people are using. People are getting creative. Uh, Whirlpool hops, um, Mosaic, Sots, Aramis. A bunch of different whirlpool hops starting to show prominence. I'll show you that in the curve later on. Wasn't used early on, but now starting to be used quite frequently. Quite frequently, actually. And dry hops, we see uh, a bunch of fruity dry hops, except for the sots. People are starting to use those tropical fruity flavors uh, in their saisons. All right, rate of hop additions. We'll start with the uh, flavor hops, which is the blue curve. 59% of the recipes used a flavor hop addition at 0.15 ounces per gallon average, or 1.12 grams per liter. Pretty tight range here between 0.05 and 0.3 grams per liter, or uh, ounce per gallon. Uh, aroma hops, which is the black curve, a big range between 0.05 and 0.6 um, ounces per gallon. 74% or three quarters of the recipes used an aroma hop. Uh, an average of 0 0.22 ounces per gallon or 1.65 grams per liter. Uh, Whirlpool, which is the green curve, huge, huge range um, from very lightly hopped to very, very heavily hopped. 22% um, of the recipes used a Whirlpool hop, an average of 0 0.27 ounce per gallon or 2.02 grams per liter. And even fewer recipes, only 8% used a dry hop at 0 0.2 ounce per gallon or 1.5 grams per liter. Another busy curve, another dual uh, axis curve here. So over here is the prominence of the hop addition. So the number of recipes that used um, an aroma or a whirlpool hop addition. And then this is the, um, the amount they used. And this is uh, against the time, right? So if we look at the first two, aroma, the usage of aroma hops is dropping with time. And the usage of Whirlpool hops is increasing with time. I think this is a wash. I think people are either putting them in at the end of the boil or doing a Whirlpool or doing both and getting the same effect. So even though we are seeing a trend down of Roma hops and a trend up of Whirlpool, I think people are just, you know, using one or the other to get the same effect. Now what is changing is the amount of late edition hops. So orange curve here, uh, Aroma hops ounces per gallon Increasing to around 0 0.3 ounce per gallon um, from, what was the average, let's see, uh, 0 0.22. So that's increasing a bit with time. And the yellow curve, which is the whirlpool ounce per gallon, is going up to 0 0.45 from um, 0 0.27. So bigger increase on the whirlpool hops. What I take away from this is if you're going to use aroma hops, you're going to use a whirlpool hop. Increase your rate of hop addition at the end if you're going for a hoppy style saison. Um, bulk spices. I've got a lot of spices, but some are used in bulk and some very minuscule amounts. Um, there were three shown here. One 
peach nectar used. Um, this is in ounces per gallon down here. One recipe used peach nectar in their classical saison and one uh, metal with it. Um, but two other ones, uh, one that used about 9% of the recipes and the other in about 3.5% of the recipes were uh, ginger here at an average of a quarter of an ounce per gallon. This is fresh ginger and lemon juice um, at an average of 0.75 ounce per gallon. So a couple recipes uses some spices, uh, yeah, those two spices. When we get to the smaller uh, amount of, I'll put this on a different scale so we could see them better. Uh, the most prominent is coriander. Um, we had about seven, 16, 17% of the recipes use coriander at an average 0 0.05 ounces per gallon. Um, and the next most prominent is orange peel. Didn't say fresh or, or sweet or bitter, uh, fresh or dried. Um, but at, at an average of about 0 0.02 ounces per gallon, and there were about 13% of the recipes used them. I think in total, about 30%, a third of the recipes used spice additions. I might show that in a later slide. Uh, some other spices used in some in lesser prominent proportions. Uh, black pepper, lemon peel, grains of paradise, and lime peel were used in a couple recipes each. I think this was three, two for that one, two for that one, and one recipe for uh, the lime peel. Ah, mash types. A <laughs> couple new different types of mashes. 74% of the recipes used an infusion mash. 19% uh, used a step mash. No, de no decoctions. Um, we had a s step ramp hybrid. We, we had a, one recipe to use a ramp mash, and that was basically starting at um, acid rest and just slowly ramping up to mash out temperatures to hit all the... Uh, different holding periods. We had another one that started at the protein rest and then ramped up. Um, and they had one did, that did a round trip. And this is basically um, a, an inverse of the Hawker's mash where they go in at 150 and then they hold there for 20 minutes and then they, sorry, 152, they hold there for 20 minutes and then they cool down. This gives you the most fermentable work because you're letting those um, uh, alpha uh, amylase enzymes chop up the middle mid sections of all your um, starch molecules and then taking it down into the beta zone where the betas start eating the ends of the, the remaining starch molecules. So this gives you the most fermentable. Never heard it called this, but it, they, they said it was a round, called a round trip mash. As far as mash rests, 5.7% um, did an acid rest. At an average of 108 Fahrenheit or 42 Celsius for an average of 20 minutes. 19% um, did a protein rest at an average of 127.5 Fahrenheit or 53 Celsius for around 21 minutes. 15% did a beta rest at 144 or 62 Celsius for an average of 46 minutes. And for the alpha rest, the average was 151 Fahrenheit or 61 Celsius for six, 63 minutes. Excuse me. Uh, we are seeing an increase in temperature for the alpha rest over time, um, somewhere around 140, lower 140s to lower 150, or upper 140s to lower 150s. Boil duration, 77-minute uh, average. We had a, anywhere between a 30-minute boil and 120-minute boil. Um, I'm going to shoot for around the 60-minute boil here for this, for my recipe. And the boil duration over time is decreasing to around 60 minutes. So uh, kind of justification for keeping with that hour-long boil, unless you need the gravity increase. Yeast, another <laughs> another area where people play. Um, most prominent is the DuPont strain, um, which is, you know, the classic Belgian Saison strain, White Labs 565. Y yeast uh, 3724. The French Saison is the next most prominent. 26% of the recipes use that. Uh, Belle Saison, which is Lalamond, 10% um, of the recipes use Belle Saison. White Labs 566, which is another Saison yeast, 8% use that. Y yeast 3726. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna butcher this name. 7% um, of the recipes use that. Then we start seeing a lot of onesies and twosies. Um, this is the DuPont, uh, not DuPont, but um, Duvel strain for Belgian Golden Strong. 
some yeast bay, saison, saccharomyces. I didn't include any brets here. These are just saccharomyces um, yeast varieties. Um, Scarpment Labs, Lalavan, Champagne yeast, some other um, saison yeast from White Labs, Mangrove Jacks, and a bunch of other ones, you know, just all over the, this is Omega 500, I think is a, one of the Belgian strains. This is where people get creative, and uh, I encourage you to get creative as well. Um, also seeing a change in time on uh, the, the yeast use. So if you look at the most prominent, which is a black curve of the Belgian Saison uh, strain, um, it's falling out of favor. People are starting to use some of these other uh, strains here and getting some different phenolics and different esters that uh, the Saison or the DuPont strain puts out. So um, while we are seeing a decrease in um, the DuPont strain, we are seeing an increase in Belle Saison and the French uh, Saison strain. So those, those are increasing with time. Very interesting to see this. Water chemistry, uh, calcium, the average was 63, magnesium was 11, sodium 27, sulfate 69, and chloride 64. Quite a few recipes share their water profiles, so pretty confident in these numbers. Fermentation temperatures, when you look at all the strains, um, it averaged between, okay, before we get started in this, fermentation temperatures, um, I'm going to present the starting and finishing fermentation temperatures. So this, this slide here, presents only the starting temperature. So when you look at all the strains combined, they started between 64 Fahrenheit and 85 Fahrenheit with an average of around 70. And I think pretty much the other three most prominent, which is the DuPont, the, the French Saison, and Belle Saison, were kind of in that same realm of somewhere around the mid 70s, mid to low 70s was the starting fermentation temperature. When you get to, uh, yeah, the average was 70. When you get to the final fermentation temperature, this is where you see a, a pretty good variation. We had one recipe go all the way up to 101 in their final uh, ramp uh, temperature. The average was 78. Um, and I think for the different strains, you're seeing an average for the, the DuPont around 80. Um, the French de Saison was right at 78 as well. And then the Belle Saison was right at 79. So again, right there together, pretty much starting at 70 and finishing at 78 was the most common uh, fermentation profile for any of these strains. Uh, carbonation volumes, the average was 3.1 volumes of CO2. And the average mash pH was 5.3. All right, let's do the Mean Brews recipe. I, have to, I am taking some liberties here. Um, I'm, I'm going with the New World variety. I am not going to try to do a classical Saison. And I'm picking some hops and yeast that I enjoy. So I didn't think that there was... This is a recipe where your artistic uh, license to be creative is really celebrated. And um, I'm going to use this, this uh, forum to get my, my thoughts on how I should formulate this recipe. Um, I will use some of the trends from Mean Brews, but... This is by no means a winning recipe uh, yet. I have yet to enter it, but I do plan to brew it. Um, starting here, Pilsner two row. Uh, we're going to use about 70% of the grist. Um, then we're going to use some um, rye malt. I am going to use rye because I think it's prominently starting to come into favor at about 10.7% of the grist. Uh, pale wheat, again, at about 10.7% of the grist. Uh, candy sugar at 5.1%. And then the carapils at 3.6. For my hops, um, I am not going to do a bittering hop addition because I get enough IBUs from these hops it, uh, at uh, the end of the boil. So I'm going to start with about 0 0.15 ounces per gallon or 1.2 grams per liter of Hallertauer Blanc at 10 minutes. Um, and then 0 0.3 ounce per gallon or 1.3 grams per liter of Nelson uh, at flame out. And then I'm going to whirlpool uh, 0.45 ounce per gallon or 3.37 grams per liter of Nelson again. So I'm going for that grape tropical flavor. Um, try to make it more wine, champagne-like, um, which is what, what I try to do with my Saisons. These numbers over here are the, uh, are the evolved um, 
numbers of the high numbers that we're seeing in the, the later recipes rather than the early ones. And again, I've, I've gone away from the classical um, noble hops and gone more um, fruity, tropical. Actually, these are more grape uh, wine flavored um, is what I'm shooting for. IBUs, we're shooting about 32 IBUs total. And I am going to spice. I'm going to put um, 0.05 ounce per gallon of coriander or 0.37 grams per liter and sweet orange peel, fresh sweet orange peel, zero point, the same amount, 0.05 ounce per gallon or 0.37 grams per liter. That is not a lot. That's just going to be in the background. Um, compare that to my wit beer recipe um, where I think we're at 0.2 ounce per gallon each. Um, it's a, it's a quarter of that. So just going to be behind the threshold of understanding or knowing what that spice is. And it's just going to barely be there. Um, I'm shooting for an original gravity 1.055 and 32 IBUs. This correlates again to the trends, um, reverse osmosis water. I'm going to shoot for this profile here, um, which gives me a pretty, pretty balanced profile of chlorides to sulfates. Um, a little high in the sodium, but uh, that's what the data showed. Um, I'm going to mash in at 5.3, and then I'm going to do a single infusion mash at 151 Fahrenheit or 66 Celsius for 60 minutes. Mash out and sparge as usual and boil for 60 minutes. I'm going to chill it to 70 uh, Fahrenheit or 21C, oxygenate and pitch. Uh, ferment at 70 Fahrenheit and free rise to 80. Uh, check the FG and hold it past the Saison stall if necessary. I just realized I have not said what strains of yeast I'm going to use. So for this one, I plan on using the um, the two most prominent, the Belgian Saison, the DuPont strain, and the um, the French Saison strain. Uh, I think the combination of both will get it past this stall. Um, and um, seen a lot of people actually start doing that to to ensure that they can ferment this to dryness, which is what you need to get, what you need to do. Um, I'm going to crash and transfer to a bottle. I'm going to bottle condition, not keg, to 3.1 volumes. It's very difficult to get the right carbonation in a keg um, and be able to serve it with any sort of um, authenticity to the style um, without bottle conditioning. And that's it. And uh, all right, for the next video, I'm actually going, I, ju I just uh, entered in one best of show at the Belgian Brew Brawl in Austin with my Belgian Dark Strong, it's Mean Brews Quad, um, which is just starting two years old and starting to come in on it to its own. So if you've been following me on uh, Instagram or Facebook, um, you've seen that I, I promised I would do this recipe and that's the next recipe that I'm going to do. So uh, look out for that video in the next couple of weeks. Uh, thanks for tuning in to another one. This has been an interesting one and I'm glad this one was behind me. Um, I'll see you in a couple of weeks and uh, happy brewing. Bye-bye.